afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Citizen Science on the Prairie. Today, a panel of presenters will share information about three citizen science opportunities for people visiting MPF prairies, specifically the iNaturalist Citizen Science Project, the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas Project, and how eBird lists contribute to bird research. My name is Erica Van Franken. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to the panelists. Since there are multiple presenters today, please indicate if your question is intended for a particular presenter or for all. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Austin Lambert is a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation at Runge Nature Center in Jefferson City. A passion for nature has led to a career spanning 15 years and still going strong while working in Illinois, Alaska, his home state of Iowa and Missouri. He especially enjoys observing and studying birds, butterflies, dragonflies, native plants, natural communities, and sharing his passion for the outdoors with others, especially his family. Today, Austin is going to talk about the iNaturalist Citizen Science Project. All right, well, thank you very much, Erica. Uh, again, my name is Austin, and I'm a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation out here at the Runge Conservation Nature Center. Uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, and you know, I just wanna talk about that term naturalist here real quick. Uh, and kind of define that because sometimes it's something that people aren't as familiar with. Uh, but if you were to look up naturalist in the dictionary, you get two definitions. One of which is a person that is an expert in nature, which is absolutely not me. Uh, the other definition is a person that is a student of nature. And I think that describes me much, much more so. And so utilizing things like iNaturalist are just one of the tools that I use to help learn even more about nature and all the different things, the different plants and animals and things that are going on around me. Uh, iNaturalist is also a great way and gives the, gives the tools that uh, many people need to study biodiversity and again, become citizen scientists. And so today we're going to be talking a little bit about, well, what is iNaturalist, uh, different ways that we can get started utilizing iNaturalist, and then talk about some of the specific projects within iNaturalist that we can go out there and use. And so kicking things off, you know, what is iNaturalist? And iNaturalist is a, a a uh, service that uh, provides a place to record and organize nature findings uh, and meet other nature enthusiasts and learn a little bit more about the natural world. iNaturalist is a joint venture between the California Academy of Science and the National Ge uh, Geographic Society with a primary goal of connecting people with nature, which is what basically my job is as well. So get out there and get people connected and, and uh, caring a little bit more, more about nature. So primary goal of connecting people with nature with a secondary goal of generating scientifically valuable data that could be accessed by other people. So going out there, connecting people with nature. Uh, it is a free downloadable app uh, for both Android and iOS devices. Uh, so you can get it on your phone, although there is also an internet format as well. So if you don't have a, a smartphone, you can still get out there and, and utilize iNaturalist. Um, and it's also an online social networking platform. And so there are different ways that you can communicate with other iNaturalist users about some of the things that you're seeing, um, adding identifications to different things that you're observing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that means here in just a second. So what does the iNaturalist app do? Well, it does several things. One of the primary things that it's utilized for is again, recording those nature-related observations. And so there's many, many observations that have, are on iNaturalist. There's about 1.3 million users of iNaturalist. Uh, so quite a few people that are out there using, utilizing that. Um, and so many, many different uh, naturalists on there. And I think they've recorded somewhere about 60 million uh, observations during the time that iNaturalist has been out there uh, and uh, available to the public to use. Now iNaturalist is really cool in that uh, when you're out there taking pictures of things, uh, you put that through the iNaturalist app and it actually suggests different identifications that uh, organism might possibly be. So when we're making observations, observations are basically uh, a look at an organism at a place and time. Um, there are some things that iNaturalist does not do when you're out there making observations. It doesn't record things like effort, uh, whether uh, organisms absent from a place, but just basically tells you if that organism is there or not. And again, 
the the uh, the computer technology that's behind the app helps you identify it, but then also those 1.3 million other naturals that are on iNaturals also help you identify uh, the organism that you are looking at. Looking at. Um, and it also allows uh, different professionals and uh, amateurs, other users of iNaturalist, to go out there and see the things that you are seeing, to share that information with others, uh, which is pretty significant. You know, when you think about the contributions that citizen scientists have made to real science out there, it's pretty staggering their contribution. Uh, one example that I have here at, uh, at the Runge Nature Center is we have this beautiful little butterfly here at Runge called a swamp metal mark, uh, which is something that I observed in iNaturalist a couple of years ago uh, out here. And I put it on iNaturalist and I didn't think too much of it because I'm fairly new to Missouri and it didn't seem that significant other than it was very, very beautiful. Well, a short time afterwards, one of our natural history biologists with the department uh, uh, emailed me and he said, hey, are you this person on this app? And I said, yes, that is me. And he's like, well, did you actually see that butterfly at Runge? And I surely did. Um, and then uh, by realizing that we saw that swamp metal mark being found by that professional, that natural history biologist, we've been able to study this butterfly a little bit more carefully. And it's believed that we have one of the biggest populations of this butterfly in all of North America. And so that kind of got the ball rolling. You know, Once we, we discovered this through this, this app, through this uh, citizen science format, um, to, to kind of realize this. So again, it can't be understated the contribution that citizen scientists have made to real science out there. And so again, a great app to get out there, record your observations, see what you're seeing, and share those sightings with other people. And so where do we get started? Uh, iNatural is a free app, so it's not going to cost you anything. So just go to your app store, and it's something that you can download. Um, from there, all you need to do is create a, a username and a password which again, and, and just need an email. That's all the information that you need in order to get started. Once you get the app onto your phone, you're then able to get out there and make your first observation, which again, is an organism at a place in time. So making observations, fairly simple. We turn on the app again. Uh, we'll get this little home screen here. And once you make a bunch of observations, you'll see all sorts of things pop up on there. But down at the bottom of our screen there, we can see that there's a little button that says observe and it looks like a little camera. We can click on that and that will access the camera on your phone. And then you can go out and you can take a picture of that organism. Um, and we want good quality pictures because the better pictures we take, the more we improve the iNaturalist technology, the better off it is or better able it is to help you identify uh, things in the future. So here we have a critter inside that hole. And it sure does look interesting, but I wonder what it is. So uh, one of the things that we oftentimes want to do, in a, especially when we're making observations in nine naturals and just to have a good picture in general, is definitely get a little bit closer uh, so you can actually see what's going on in there. So once we get a little closer, we can see we have a little frog in that hole. And we can add that picture to our observation. Or if we already have a picture of an animal or a plant on our phone, uh, we can click this little photo icon and we can access our, our, our camera reel uh, and choose a photo. So click on one of those photos or take the photo by pushing that green button there, hit next. And then we're at our details page on our observation. Now we can do a couple of different things. We can add more photos and oftentimes more photos is better, especially when we're looking at things like plants where we could take a picture of the flower and the leaves and the entire plant, getting as many different angles as we possibly can. So we can add more pictures or just use the one picture that we do have. So maybe this frog was quick and I only got one. Then I can click on this, what did you see button? And iNaturalist again will automatically come up with suggestions based on, it's kind of like the same facial recognition technology that we see on all the FBI shows and stuff like that. But these utilizing that for everything now from animals to products to, to whatever it might be. Um, and they'll give me suggestions. So they're pretty sure it's in the hyla genus of, tr of tree frogs and possibly one of these species. Now being a professional naturalist, I know it's very, very difficult to tell these different tree frogs apart just on a photograph alone. Um, so I might just click that uh, hyla, and that's what my um, observation will be labeled as. From there, I can make any notes, like this frog was found in a, in a bluebird nest box. Uh, I can double check my date. I can change my location if my location was not accurate. And lots of times when we're taking pictures of our phone, the app already wants to utilize the GPS information that's in your phone. So usually the, app, the, the um, location is pretty accurate, but you can move that around. We can also mark things as open, obscured, or private. What that's referring to is uh, how other people are able to get on there 
and see if they can see exactly where I saw that problem. If I obscure it, it changes it to a 15 mile radius where they can't see exactly where it was, or I can just close it where they can't see where I saw where it was at all, uh, whether it was captive or cultivated. And I can also add it to any particular project that I'd like. And so I did see this one at Runge, and so I would add it to a Runge uh, project. And we'll talk about more what it means to be a project here in just a second. From there, I have what I saw, the tree frog, when I saw it, and the place. And again, those are the important pieces of information when we're making an observation. I can then hit share. And then my uh, observation is then added to the iNaturalist community, at which time other people can get on there and comment on that observation. Now, there are a few other functions down here when we are in the app. We, now we can see that the Mies is highlighted. That shows me all the observations that I made. If we went out to activity, we could see how people are commenting on different things that I said, or maybe they have a, a, another suggestion of identification. I can explore and see other observations that have been made around me and click on more, which is how I would explore projects, which again, we'll talk about in just a second. So that's the basis of getting, getting started. Of course, there's no substitute for just getting out there and playing with it. You can't screw stuff up too bad. And I know it's something a lot of people are worried about. Get out there and play uh, and you'll get it figured out. Um, so those are things that iNatural does, makes the observation, but there are things that iNatural should not be used for or by. So because there is a social media component and location information, it should not be utilized for those that are under 13 years old. Um, that's kind of iNatural's policy, unless they're supervised by an adult. But there is another app that uses, and it's actually a partnership with iNatural's called Seek, which utilizes that same technology, but takes out the social media component of it and takes out the location information. There's also challenges, lots of other fun things on Seek. Uh, it's not a, or a photo storage site, so it could crash. You could lose your picture, so don't put precious things on there. Uh, it is not to be used for humans or pets or livestock, even if you have the cutest dog in the world. iNaturalist doesn't want to hear about it, and I know you don't have the cutest dog in the world because I certainly do. Um, and it's also not a place for storing biologically sensitive information. So there are some species that are better off left off iNaturalist, those species that people might want to go out and either take for captive purposes to you know, a plant they might want to raise in their garden because it's rare, a uh, rare species of butterfly that uh, uh, somebody would like to pin or something like that, or maybe a, a herp that somebody would like to hold on to. Or again, working with the department, sometimes we get some cool experiences where we go out and we do like bear den checks and that type of thing. Also stuff that would not be appropriate for, for iNaturalist. Um, so again, lots of things we can do, mostly adding those observations, uh, but a few things that we shouldn't. Now there are additional projects, and I keep on talking about those projects. Anytime you add something onto iNaturalist, you are being a citizen scientist. And again, those experts can access that information. But every once in a while, a user on iNaturalist or an agency uh, or a uh, um, maybe a nonprofit or something like that, might go out and might try and create a special project where they can study things on a smaller scale. So something that we've created here at Runge at many other nature centers uh, with the Department of Conservation is a Runge biodiversity project in the case of Runge, though it might be Powder Valley or any other location, where we try and keep track of all the different observations that are made just here at the nature center. And so this is uh, great information that we can utilize to make management decisions and do all sorts of different things with. And so out here at Runge, uh, this is actually an outdated snapshot here, but we're actually over 10,000 observations of 1,800 different species made by 200 individuals. So, um, you know, gaining lots of information about our area. Another interesting project to join is a City Nature Challenge, especially for those that are in the St. Louis area or Kansas City area, uh, which is kind of a, a, a worldwide competition where large cities compete against one, one another to see who has the most diverse cities, uh, biodiverse cities. Uh, and that's actually coming up this weekend. So it starts on the 29th and runs till May 2nd. So we're going to be up here pretty quick. And then, of course, this is Citizen Science on the Prairie. And the Missouri Prairie Foundation also has a Citizen Science and Biodiversity Project that can be joined. And the vast majority of the prairies that are a part of uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation are listed on there. And so you can also join those and go out to any one of those prairies and make some observations. And again, the things that you observe are very valuable, even though there are professional biologists and things that go out to these prairies to observe things. So you never know when you're going to get a picture of the, the very unique or very rare thing uh, that uh, you know, could change how we, how we manage a lot of these different areas. So definitely get out there, explore the app, explore those projects, um, and get out there and uh, do some eye-natting. 
So uh, again, I want to thank Prairie Foundation for having me, and hopefully we have some good questions here in a little bit. Thank you, Austin, for that great introduction to iNaturalist. Uh, next up is Doug Helmers, who retired in 2018 from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as the Iowa Private Land State Coordinator. As project leader for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, Doug worked with private landowners to improve fish and wildlife habitat on their lands. Prior to working for Fish and Wildlife, he was a wetland emphasis team leader with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Missouri. In addition, he spent three years working for the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network in Massachusetts. Doug received his BS and MS in fisheries and wildlife from the University of Missouri. He grew up in the cornfields of Western Illinois and has lived in Missouri for over 35 years. He enjoys traveling, outdoor recreation, and spending time with his dogs at the farm where he and his wife are restoring and managing 65 acres of prairie and woodland in Sheraton County. Today, Doug is going to tell us about the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas Project. Thank you, Erica. And good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon. Um, so the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas was started uh, in August of 2020. So it's fairly new. Uh, and we really just got started fairly soon. Uh, and this is a collaboration between the Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, the Xerces Society, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, and the University of Missouri. So what is the Bumblebee Atlas, Missouri Bumblebee Atlas? Well, it's a community science project that's aimed at tracking bumblebees, their habitat associations, and the conservation of bumblebees in Missouri. Community science means essentially that it's for everyone and it's voluntary. So anyone can be involved in the, in the Bumblebee Atlas and, and in citizen science type projects. How does it work, essentially? Well, volunteers or community scientists are asked to choose one of 75 grids across Missouri and are asked to do complete at least two surveys sometime between the 1st of June and the end of September. Now, these grids are fairly large. They're 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers, which is essentially about 31 miles by 31 miles. Next, it would need to start to learn the protocols of the, of the survey. And uh, the sponsors then uh, have developed a lot of online training, um, which is, you know, online training is essentially for you to uh, be able to acquire the necessary skills uh, for conducting surveys. Not only are there online training, there's also a extensive uh, field training that that has uh, the opportunity to be done uh, around the state at di different times of the year. We, the Prairie Foundation last year, conducted a field training uh, at Drover's Prairie, and just essentially to try to get more people involved uh, from MPF into the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas. Both the online and field training include bumblebee ecology, bumblebee identification, survey methods, habitat survey techniques, capture and care methods for bumblebees, photographic tips for photographing bumblebees, and data entry. A list of gear is then provided uh, or provided to you to be able to obtain, uh, such as nets, vials, coolers, and of course, a camera. Conducting bumblebee surveys, there's essentially two types of surveys that can be done through the Atlas. Uh, the first is a, a point survey. Point surveys are approximately two and a half hectares or, or two and a half acres or about one hectare. Uh, and a surveyor then does a survey for essentially 20 or 45 searching person minutes. So, so you only really count the 45 minutes while you're searching for bumblebees. The second survey is a roadside survey, which is done, uh, of course, along roadsides in about a 10 mile stretch where uh, five different surveys will be done uh, along this, an area about every half a mile. But we have the, the surveys and we'll also include habitat surveys included with that. The 
This is just some, sort of briefly going through a, a, a bit of a survey. Uh, this is my lovely wife, Amanda, uh, catching a, a bumblebee. Uh, we're essentially catching them in sweep nets. We then transfer them over to a vial. And while that collection and transfer is being done, then we are taking information on uh, the host species, the host plant that that bumblebee was on. The next part is then we transfer these bumblebees into a cooler full of ice. And this is the really cool part about these surveys is this is a no-kill survey. So we're essentially just taking the, the bumblebees, putting them down into ice so that we can cool them well down till they sort of go into a bit of a torpor. And that allows us then to uh, make the observations to those bumblebees. And so we can move them around, take photographs, uh, and then after about five to seven minutes, they warm up and fly away back to the prairie where we, where we first took them from. There is uh, a bumblebee guide uh, to help folks uh, with identification of these bees. Some of them aren't all that uh, incredibly easy, but the great thing about the bumblebee atlas is, is that if there is somebody who'd be able to come back and check your work to see how, how your identification went. And believe me, I've missed a number of them. So this is sort of an example of, of then, you know, they give you to help you out with getting the right techniques and, and being able to uh, photograph these bumblebees. Uh, and so this is a, a Southern Plains bumblebee. This is one that actually Amanda and I caught on our farm last summer. Next thing is to conduct habitat assessments. So we've, we've already caught our bees and worked our bees up. And then what we wanna do is come back and do a, a habitat assessment. These are not incredibly uh, time consuming. They're, they're actually fairly quick to do. Um, we basically need to know what kind of habitat you're in, uh, what habitats are surrounding the area you're conducting, uh, how many plant species and, and some of the plants that are available. Now, not once they're available, but then we need to get an idea of the percentage of the area that's in bloom. And so how much are really available for bumblebees to be using? And then what type of management is then occurring on the area? And finally, after we've conducted the bumblebee survey and worked them all up and did our habitat assessments, then we'd be entering, submitting our data. Uh, all the data goes through a national database through uh, bumblebeewatch.org. And you would just go in and go to the tab for the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas and then enter your data there. You can do it both on a, on a PC or on, your, uh, or on your phone, either one, however it works out best. So to, to get involved in the Bumblebee Atlas, you essentially need to go to missourybumblebeeatlas.org and sort of get get started and get, get yourself signed up. Um, you know, as a board member uh, of, of Missouri Prairie Foundation, I was really excited to sort of get involved with this. Uh, Amanda and I did a, a training last year uh, for, like I said, many of the members had about 15 to 20 show up last year. Uh, we're gonna be conducting another field day this year at the Runge, uh, at the Runge Prairie on July 9th. And we're also going to be doing some trainings at our, uh, our uh, field day or the National Prairie Day on June 4th. So kind of go to the foundation website and, and look to places to be able to sign up for that. Just a little bit to give you some real quick effort of what we've done for to date. Uh, so far, we've had about 164 participants, collected almost 2,400 bumblebees and detected eight species. And then we've also conducted about almost 300 uh, habitat surveys. The uh, species then for, for what we've been finding, uh, the, sort of the four, four most common ones would be, of course, the common Eastern bumblebee, which one would expect, uh, the brown belted, uh, two spotted and American bumblebee. And you can kind of see the rest of the, the kind of followed down through that. So let's just kind of give you a real brief overview of, of what the Atlas is like. Um, I'd be happy to be emailed. You can get me through the website um, and uh, appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, possibly get involved. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Erica. Thanks so much, Doug.
for that introduction to the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas Project. And next is Bruce Schutte, who retired from working 36 years as a park naturalist at Quiver River State Park, where he was involved in natural resource management, including prescribed burns, exotic species control and ecosystem management, natural resource inventory, collections, monitoring, working with researchers and nature education. He has served on the MPF board since January 2000, served as secretary from 2005 to 2012, and is vice president of science and management and chairman of the science and management committee. He has a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from the University of Missouri, Columbia. And today, Bruce is going to talk about how eBird lists contribute to bird research. Thank you, Erica. And uh, first I'd like to mention as vice president for science and management, that the uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation is very interested in uh, science and research in protecting our prairies. In fact, it's part of the, the mission of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And so um, the foundation itself, we uh, do contract surveys with, um, with individuals and uh, uh, people doing uh, natural history surveys. We uh, make our prayers available for certain research projects um, and we uh, do surveys in that ourselves. So this is uh, another way that we can help gather some information uh, on what's on our prairies because that is very valuable uh, to have all this information. So um, eBirds, uh, is a project that uh, was started by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. Um, it launched in 2002, and um, it's become uh, kind of a worldwide sort of phenomenon for keeping track of where birds are located. Uh, you can see here, um, this first part is just information uh, from what I've done, but uh, you can see down here, um, at the bottom, uh, just a few statistics that worldwide eBird records are for over 10,000 species of birds. There have been over 66 million uh, completed checklists and over 770,000 people have contributed checklists to eBirds. Uh, and just in North America, uh, 2,118 species have been recorded uh, as you can see, the bulk of the worldwide checklist, almost 54 million from North America, and uh, 640,000 uh, people in North America contribute to eBirds. So um, it's quite a project that's really gained a lot of momentum in the last uh, about 20 years that eBirds has been going. So uh, what are some of the, the benefits in that um, for eBirds? Well, first of all, it helps people uh, that are serious birders find more birds because you can see where other people are finding them and uh, when they're finding them and that helps, um, helps you. It also helps you keep track of uh, your bird lists and photos and, uh, and that. Um, so all of the lists that you enter are uh, archived in a database that you have access to. And so it, it keeps track of what all you saw, where you saw it. Uh, but then um, you are also um, able to explore what other people are finding around the world because not can you just see your sightings, but you can see what other people are contributing from other parts of the world, but also just right in your county or your neighborhood. Uh, you'd actually be part of one of the world's largest uh, birding communities with so many people participating in eBirds. But very importantly, uh, with this being citizen science, is that uh, as you enter these sightings, you're contributing to science and conservation. Uh, because this eBird data is um, archived, and um, it's securely archived, and then um, it's maintained in a manner that's accessible to, um, to everyone. So other birders can uh, make use of your sightings, but then it's also available for 
uh, people in conservation, uh, scientists, researchers, they have access to all that information. So it's not just a few people uh, contributing to what's known about these birds, which are of course moving around quite a bit, but it's these millions of checklists that have been turned in uh, that is uh, contributing so much to what's known about our birds. Uh, now, the quality of the data is also really important. So um, as you're adding records, when you get to the point of having a, a checklist and you're entering records, um, it's only the records of birds you're likely to see that you have immediate access to. Uh, and so it's experts, um, it's the, the book by uh, Mark Robbins, The Status and Distribution of Birds in Missouri is kind of a guideline uh, for these checklists to be um, kept current as to what's a, what you're likely to see at that time. If you see something that's different, or if you see uh, excessive numbers, then um, you can still report those. Uh, you can enter more data or enter photos, but, um, but there's uh, reviewers and those reviewers will go through and determine if those records seem to be good and valid and should be put into the, the eBirds database. So uh, just very quickly, um, it's a real simple thing to do if you're uh, going to want to submit your checklist. Um, when I would open a page, it would go to something like this. Uh, I click on submit. You come up with um, one page that asks where you were. So you can pick from any of the sites that you have already entered birds from, like in this case, we'll say Golden Prairie, uh, an MPF prairie. If it's a place that's new that you haven't done before, then you go to find it on a map. You pick a county, like this is Barton County in Southwest Missouri. Uh, all these uh, kind of teardrops are hotspots. So if it's a hotspot where people have already been entering a number of records, usually public lands, you can just click on that and you can get that in your um, box of areas you've seen. If um, it's not, then you can still uh, add it as your own siding from someplace else, like up here along this road. You could add a, a siding, just one of your sightings. It's still in the database, but it doesn't show up as a hotspot for everybody. When you zoom in closer, you can see Golden Prairie here uh, marked as a hotspot. Also in this area, there's Doris Creek Prairie as a hotspot. Um, after you've just chosen the location, you put in a date, uh, you list uh, the kind of observation, which um, in most cases will be traveling, uh, but if you're just staying in one place or if you're not primarily birding, but you see some birds of interest, you can click incidental. It doesn't have as much information with it, but it's still, um, still helpful. Besides the, the date and the type, you just simply put in the time you started. Um, you put in how many hours and minutes that you birded. You put in the distance that you went. And there's not a set area for this. So you can do this in your front yard. You can do this on your farm. You can go to a national wildlife refuge or a state park or conservation area or an MPF prairie. And um, however many miles that you drive or walk, you put that in there, the number in your group. If you forget to put one of those things in, uh, it will come up with reminders and let you know those are essential, but those are actually the only required information. And then from there, you would click continue and you go to the bird list. And as you go through the bird list, you just simply put in how many birds of the different species that you see. This, for example, is a completed list for Golden Prairie. Uh, so you can see that that particular day I saw 17 species. I entered pictures I was able to take of three of them. It shows how that it was just me, how many hours I was doing it, how many miles I walked. And if you've got some other notes to put in, you can do that. You can also put in notes under the particular species like uh, this turkey vulture, which was basically just a flyover, not uh, down in the prairie itself. All these records that are compiled. So now if I go to Golden Prairie um, and click for all years, 
Over the years, there's been 93 checklists completed by different people, only a couple by me, but 93 checklists are available. There's 106 <clears throat> species that have been recorded. And you can see those here. You can see who has recorded the most number of birds and the most recent sightings that have been filled out. And this is really nice too, because you can go to what's called an illustrated checklist. And on this illustrated checklist, it shows you when the different records of that species have been. Uh, again, it will list photos, like in this case of the lark bunting, uh, that's very helpful to document uh, a rare uh, sighting. But in other cases, what it does is give you a good idea when you expect to find that bird. Savannah sparrows are winter residents, so you just see them in the late fall and through the winter and they leave in the spring. Henslow sparrows are nesting species and they show up in kind of early summer and are just found throughout the summer season. Sedge wrens <coughs> are mostly a, a breeding resident, but they don't usually get here until July or August uh, in, the, in the year. So you see their records showing up later. So it provides all the information. It's also used in conjunction with things like All About Birds through Cornell University. And uh, you have the option to look at many different kinds of maps that they have, um, and they show astounding accuracy. Um, this is a map for the Henslow Sparrow, shows its winter range and its breeding range. You can look at the breeding range and see um, <clears throat> habitat densities, relative abundance. So you can see the darker areas are where they're more abundant. And very cool, they have, because of all these sightings coming in from everybody all over, they can have these animated maps that shows you where they're being seen at different times of the year. So going throughout the year from January down south, as they move up and Henslow sparrows are pretty well camouflaged. So there's not a lot of records of them migrating back and forth, but then you can see where they, they end up uh, during the, the breeding season. And so by like around the 1st of June, oops, sorry, but you can see how they, how they move through the area. Now let's take dick sissels. Um, dick sissels, another grassland bird. Um, they winter down in Northern South America. They breed up here. Uh, this again shows their density during the breeding season. And again, their animation shows going from winter down in South America, you can see their migration moving up to their breeding range during the summer and then back down. And all these kinds of maps are available because of the data from eBirds that everybody that's participated in eBirds has helped to collect. So uh, when you go to the website, um, it shows you at the very bottom down here, you can see these different tabs. So you can do uh, go to these kinds of areas for information. It is probably gonna be more interesting for your birding, but then you can also go over here and see some of the ways that these, um, all this information is being used in publications and the conservation impact of uh, all these different projects that goes on through eBirds. Everybody that knows me knows that I'm pretty uh, technologically challenged, uh, especially when it comes to phones. So I don't have the eBird app on my phone, but uh, a lot of people use it. It is available. So there is a, a phone app you can use. And it also <clears throat> kind of ties in with some other projects. Uh, eBirds is involved in like the backyard bird count. If you've ever taken part in that, that's a project through eBirds. Um, and the same thing with the International Migratory Bird Day, which is coming up the second Saturday in May, um, International Bird Day. And again, all the records go through eBirds for uh, those kind of special projects that they have. So thank you. Austin, Doug, Bruce, those were excellent presentations. This is Carol David, Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and we do have some questions. Um, 
Uh, there's a question for Austin from Judy. She says, how do you determine if a species is biologically sensitive enough that you should not share that information on iNaturalist? Uh, very good question. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a, a terrific answer for that, though. Um, sometimes it depends, depends on the circumstance. So doing things like when I was putting the metal marks on iNaturalist, uh, you know, that's here at the Nature Center where there's many people that walk, there's lots of staff, lots of volunteers. Uh, so it's a very well policed area, even though it's a rare butterfly. So we're not as worried about people coming in and uh, taking some of those butterflies out of there. Uh, but it's not always quite that easy. Um, a resource to start with uh, is there's a, a checklist that's put out by the, by the department uh, each year, uh, the Missouri Species and Communities of Conservation Concern Checklist. That'd be a good tool to start with and see if uh, some of the species that you're um, submitting onto iNaturalist are, are in line with some of those, and then you might consider obscuring it at least, which again, uh, still would tell you the general area that it's been, been seen in um, without telling you the exact location. Uh, but it, it takes a little bit of judgment on the, of the part of the observer, uh, which again, is, is not an awesome answer. Uh, and also, you know, there's lots of different groups out there that have different interests in different types of organisms. And so just kind of think about some of those things. And I know we like to think of people being the best, uh, but we also know the opposite is true sometimes. So keep those things in mind. But uh, yeah, start with that checklist, uh, kind of go from there. Um, sometimes when you make an observation, you can look at uh, more information about that organism on iNaturalist. And sometimes it'll tell you whether it's vulnerable or, or some of those things. But uh, um, yeah, again, not a good answer, but hopefully some of that's helpful. Thank you, Austin. And did you say that the the, the the person who's created the project can go in and obscure some observations? So it, it kind of depends. Uh, if someone were to submit uh, observation to the Runge Biodiversity Project, of which I am the curator for that project, nobody else would be able to see an obscured observation. But because I uh, am running that project, I still would be able to see the exact location. Um, now, I can't go back to their observation and change anything other than asking them to change something, because again, using that that uh, uh, social media function of that. Uh, so I can't change anything, uh, unfortunately, but I could ask somebody to do something like that. And so if you found something crazy at the prairie uh, that uh, MPF was worried about, I'm sure they would reach out to you and say, hey, can you please obscure that? And of course, wanting more information as well, I'm sure. Thank you. Another question about iNaturalist for you, Austin. Can you address the topic of misidentifications? Uh, it certainly happens, uh, as as it does with eBird and all these other things. Uh, you know, we're humans that are out there doing things. Um, oftentimes, over over time, as those observations are still on there, things eventually get worked out to where they they are a little bit more accurate. Um, again, not not absolutely perfect in, in no way, shape, or form, and that's why getting those all those high quality photos or the sound recordings, which it also works off of, uh, are very, very valuable. And that way other people can look at that and chime in uh, you know, their, um, their, uh, their opinion on those different observations. And usually over time they get worked out. Of course, there still are misidentifications that, that occur. Um, and there's, there's not something we always do about that. Sometimes the computer technology is also off and it will tell you things, crazy things. Sometimes I know people have taken pictures of mallard ducks and it came back hippopotamus. Uh, as what well. so I mean that that happens and that's again on the user to use their best judgment of whether that species that's being suggested is uh, is a, a possibility or not. Um, but you know those things happen and the technology is constantly improving but there's because we're people doing human things we're always going to misidentify things which is which is honestly nothing new it's, it's been happening since the beginning of time so it still still will be well into the future. Thank you. I've, I've used iNaturals to a limited extent, and it, it actually, I find it incredibly remarkable how accurate it is. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, there is that function that you showed us where you can just identify to the general, you know, to the genus yeah. or, or a higher level. So you don't have to feel bad about not being able to identify it to species. It's better to, uh, to identify it to a higher level organism than to, than to risk misidentifying it. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, question for Doug. Um, on the bumblebee surveys, have the homing abilities of the chilled bees been, been assessed? Oh, you're muted, Doug. That's a great question. And 
Uh, when I took my original bumblebee training, I believe that was addressed. Um, someone had asked a, a very similar question. And according to the experts of the Xerxes Society, that they did not believe if, if it was, it was something fairly temporary. Um, but then after a little bit of time, they were able to, to get right back to their, to their nests. So I think it is something they have addressed. Thank you. Question for Bruce. Is eBird better than Merlin for doing these projects, these bird survey pro or sighting projects? Well, I'm not real familiar with Merlin, but I was thinking Merlin was more for identification and eBirds is more for keeping sort of archived records of your sightings from different locations. Or maybe Merlin can do that some, but, um, and actually I'm not sure that Merlin may not be even associated with the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology also. Um, but eBirds I think is a place where um, normally you would go to uh, put in your whole list of things you see you know, for the day or at a particular location. So an eBird checklist, sometimes you might send it in with only a couple birds listed, but sometimes you could uh, go to a conservation area and see 50 or 60 or 70 species that all go in on one checklist. So, um, you know, it mentions, mil you know, millions of checklists, but there's, you know, many more than that actual sightings of birds that would be a record of what's at that location at that time. And, and Bruce, I can jump in there a little. I've used Merlin quite a bit. Uh, and you're right, it is more for identification purposes. Um, there's a sound feature that will help you identify birds by sound, a photo option, kind of working the same type as, as iNaturalist, same technology. Uh, you can report birds through Merlin, but it's more of like an incidental uh, basis. So you're not having as much value on that observation as you would through the eBird checklist. And that the, they are uh, coordinated with each other, but again, it's not uh, for a for a project and keeping track of of birds. There's a little bit less value in doing it through Merlin than through doing it through eBird. Thanks. Yeah, and with eBirds, because uh, you can submit eBird records in different ways and stuff. It's just amazing what's out there and how you can build up like a checklist for an area. Um, over time uh, with getting the good information of like when they're there, when they're not there, that sort of thing. Thank you. Uh, you know, Austin, regarding um, iNaturalist and, and really this would pertain to, to birds and bumblebees to some extent as well. I, I was thinking that, you know, when you mentioned about the meadow mark, I was looking up its host plants, which are thistles and we have native thistles and in the case of insects, if you're finding, or you know, or, or many insects whose larval uh, stage feeds on plants, it can give you clues about host plants that are in the area as well. Um, I had a question about seek. Uh, Austin, you mentioned this was the iNaturalist uh, functionality without the social media component. Can so could a child use seek? But or uh, but then upload their information to an established iNaturalist project. Uh, so uh, Seek is not no they would not be able to put stuff from Seek onto iNaturalist. Um, Seek is something that kind of stands stands alone. It uses the same technology as far as the computer technology to identify things, um, but there's no social media, no uploading it uh, for access for for other people or anything like that. Um, there. You know, so for those folks that don't want those things, Seek is the better option than iNaturalist. Uh, Seek also has a really cool camera function where you pull up the camera and you can scan it across your environment and it will identify things as you go to the level that it can. So that's, I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, I wish iNaturalist had that, but, uh, it, but it doesn't at this point. Uh, but no, there's no way of sharing that information or anything along those lines. Um, Seek does use iNaturalist, it does go the other way, where Seek will access that iNaturalist information and kind of lets you know what organisms and things are most commonly being reported to iNaturalist uh, during the time that you're using the Seek app. But um, no, it's 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 very on, on the cautious side of uh, making sure that there's no way that somebody could trace back to where those observations are being made. 
I see. Thank you. But as you said, uh, for somebody under 13, as long as an adult was mm -hmm. with that person, um, that young person could, they could together use iNaturalist as long as an adult was there. Absolutely. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I wanted, I, I don't see any other questions right now, but if anybody does have any other questions, please do share them in the Q&A. Oh, I just found it. Saw another one. Um, question for uh, really all, maybe not so much birds, but um, bumblebees and iNaturalist, please address the chance for poaching and over collecting. And maybe we'll start with, uh, start with you, Austin. And I guess there's really, ideally no collection is going on. And with the bumblebees, they're captured, but then they're released. But why don't you, uh, Austin, you start and then Doug. Yeah, uh, so uh, as far as, you know, again, when we're going out there making our naturalist observations, we're not collecting those things. It's kind of like along the same lines as the, the bumblebee atlas and eBird, where we're just observing uh, and then leaving the critter out there. Of course, poaching and collecting butterflies and that type of thing, um, it, it, it could happen. Anytime you submit anything using Facebook or any type of social media, there's people out there that can see it and use that information for, for bad. Uh, which is why, again, we try and go out there, um, obscure things when we need to obscure them, uh, don't show areas when we don't, again, it's sure the most sensitive species, which as we talked about, is not something that we can just easily always determine, uh, something we have to kind of have to use our, judge, our judgment on. Um, you know, many places, um, I don't see that being a major issue, but it, but it certainly could, could happen. Um, so we'll just have to, again, use our best judgment when we're out there submitting things to any type of platform. Just like if we submit things to eBird for a species that net is nesting, uh, there's a good chance people could show up there to see it nesting and they could end up disturbing it. That could be a bad thing. So uh, we're hoping that we're getting more good than uh, more good than bad things happening, though. Thank you. Doug, did you want to add anything? No, I think Austin covered really well. I mean, yeah, you know, with insects, uh, you know, with the bumblebees, of course, we're, we're releasing them. Uh, but, you know, there's always bad players out there. I mean, there's such a huge trade in, in international insect sales. Um, but, um, you know, we just have to, to, you know, to try to do our best. Yes, and I, I think it is important to remember that, I mean, those things, unfortunately, have had been happening long before these technologies were available. Mm -hmm. And, of course, these technologies uh, can more rapidly <coughs> make information be known. But as Austin said, you know, balancing people getting out, learning more, observing more, and and in observations comes deeper appreciation and interest in protecting those habitats. So, um, so I, I think you're right. It's it's a balance. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that um, as as Doug mentioned, we have some field opportunities available on Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies. We have a number of uh, guided hikes in May, in, in early May uh, as well. So do look at the uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation website, or if you get our e-newsletter, um, we listed all of those in the e-newsletter e e e yesterday. Doug mentioned about um, his uh, at, uh, Missouri Bumblebee Atlas training in July. We don't have that on the website yet, but we will soon. Annie mentioned our uh, Prairie BioBlitz event that we will have on um, the 2022 National Prairie Day, which this year will be June 4th. And our BioBlitz will actually be June 4th and 5th. So folks can camp out on the prairie tent camp if they like. And we will have activities uh, the afternoon of, of that Saturday and the next morning uh, bird watching, early morning bird watching, uh, bumblebee identification. Doug's going to do a Missouri bumblebee atlas training. We'll have a beetle expert, pollinator expert, butterflies, plants, prairie ecology, mammals, herpetology. So it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be at the prairie that the Prairie Foundation purchased in December of 2021. Um, in it's near Deepwater, Missouri, in St. Clair County. Doesn't have a name yet, but we we will have a name when we will be dedicating it that day, June fourth. Um, and we will. Uh, Erica will send out an email uh, tomorrow or the next day with a recording of this webinar and some of the resources that were mentioned today. <clears throat> and um, if anybody has any other questions uh, before we sign off. Uh, this is your chance. And Carol, if, can I make one quick point? You bet. 
So uh, the man and I did kind of reminded me of this is that from the state of Missouri standpoint, um, all you folks who are out there doing citizen science work, um, you know, we, we have just, just from a bumblebee standpoint, have increased the number of county records by 23 uh, just since this atlas has started. And so that type of information is really important to, to Missouri and the, and the natural history of Missouri being able to, you know, find, you know, where a lot of these different species are located, whether it be through plants or birds or insects or whatever we're looking at. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you folks are out there doing and adding is, is really important. Very good point. So if any of you are in central Missouri or heading to central Missouri, you can go to Range Conservation Nature Center and use the iNaturalist uh, or contribute to the, the iNaturalist project there as well as hike and, and enjoy the wonderful facilities at the Nature Center in Jefferson City. And you are always welcome on Missouri Prairie Foundation Prairies. I don't see any other questions. Oh, there's one more question <laughs> here for Doug. Do the bumblebee records indicate habitat conservatism? Hmm, good question. Um, what I guess I would say about that is that it, it's really, it's given us the opportunity to know presence, absence, where potential habitat is available. Um, you know, of course, we're not going to find a lot of bumblebees out in the middle of cornfield. So, you know, where, where we have done restoration work and or, and or have uh, native habitats, it's going to certainly show us, you know, those areas that are providing the habitat required for those species. Um, you know, and the diversity of the, the bumblebees then is probably going to have to do with the, the diversity of the, of the plants that are using. And that's one of the things we're trying to learn about this, this bumblebee atlas is, or what are the main uh, host plants that these bumblebees are using uh, throughout the state. Thank you. All right, with that, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Your presentations were excellent. And thanks, everybody, for joining us and for your interest in uh, documenting uh, native biodiversity that's out there, all these wonderful opportunities. And uh, thank you so much. We will have another uh, webinar in two weeks. It is geared to women landowners, uh, farmers, about uh, prairie strips. Uh, the, uh, it's an agricultural practice where of putting in strips of prairie plants for soil conservation and, and water conservation. And we'll just keep on going with uh, more webinars and master classes every other Wednesday uh, throughout the year. So do join us and watch for an email tomorrow or the next day from Erica. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.